Yep. All right, Ryan. So let's let's dive into some team topics real quick. We're gonna go dive into the. We're gonna talk Notre, first about the Notre Dame offense, and then defense about the spring breakouts that we saw. The guys that either had legit breakouts or guys that showed flashes that we think are most important to this football team in the fall, meaning can they them carrying over this breakout into the fall is the most important. So we'll talk about two or three guys on, on both sides of the ball. Let's kick things off offense on offensive side of the ball, Ryan. Who's a guy that you thought had a spring a, a breakout or showed flashes of that player this spring that he has to carry in the fall if this team is going to reach its potentials? Potential. It's it's a player that Notre Dame fans know well at this point, but I think it's Chris Tyree for me. I really think it is because the reason that I put him in this category is because he's playing a position that is new to him, right? He's playing a slot position where I think that you got a little bit of a taste as far as this spring of what's going to be the role for Chris Tyree. Like I expect him to run routes as a receiver. I expect him to do some RPO game out of the slot. But I also expect them to be able to use him as a guy that they can give an end around to, that they can run a jet sweep to at times, that they can motion into the backfield. And I really think about this offense, Brian, for me, it's like, I think that one part that Notre Dame needs more of moving forward, especially with the fact that we know that under Jared Parker, this is going to be a little bit more of an RPO heavy team. I think you need guys that can make some Make some things happen after the catch. Guys that can make things happen in space. Because, Ryan, you can run RPOs all you want, but if teams aren't afraid of it, well, let them catch a six-yard hitch. I'd rather them catch a six-yard hitch than freaking hand the ball off to Aldrick Estime or or, yes. or Lo- Jadarian Price or Jeremiah Love. Ab- exactly right. You need guys that can scare you in the RPO game. Because yeah. there's towers everywhere, right? And there's physicality everywhere. Like I think that Jaden Thomas, for instance, catching a ball in space, he could break a tackle or two, and he can get some extra tough yardage. But there aren't many guys in this offense, running backs, wide receivers included, that if you miss him in space, just one missed tackle, the guy's going to take a 10-yard RPO, you know, just glance, or not glance, RPO arrow route, for instance, and take it for 70. Like, there's just not many guys. Glances too, Ryan. I mean, glances too. If you miss him by half a step on a glance route, which for fans at home looks a lot like a slant, it, it just, does. there's a lot of, ju- sometimes it's going to look exact. Sometimes it is a slant. Sometimes it gets extended. Sometimes it's more of an in. It's sort of like an option route for a slant, essentially, is what a glance route is to me. That's the best way to explain it to people. Yeah. But it's going to look like a, a slant a lot of times. But if you miss him by half a step, it's. He gone, man. He gone. Over. I, I mean, and, and I think there's a couple running backs that if healthy and used this fall could be that guy. You know, like you could see Jadarian Price. Create but a big we play didn't that see him way, this Jeremiah Love. Right, right. But exactly. we didn't see, you didn't them see him this in the spring. spring. Exactly. But as a guy that is legitimately going to line up at wide receiver a lot in 2023, you just don't have a ton of that on this roster right now. Guys that can really make you miss. Guys that can really turn a small gain into a big play. So I look at Chris Tyree, the added dimension that he has in which should be an RPO heavy system. I really think that he could be a dynamic space player and a guy that creates a lot of explosive plays in a new role in this offense in 2023. I think Jabron Payne is a guy that comes to mind when I think of this conversation because him emerging makes you feel better about the talent at running back. Like if this is supposedly your lowest guy on the totem pole and he looks like that all spring, not just a blue gold game, we had that nice run, but we saw him in the in the two the two practices we were at look exactly like what he looked at at the spring game even better at times. So you start to feel better there. But the guy, there's two guys I'm going to go with. Ryan is number one is Tobias Merriweather. Yeah, he had a spring breakout to the point where the perception is he's going to be their best receiver. I I, I think right now I'm still more confident in Jaden Thomas being their best receiver because I on a consistent basis you know what Jaden can bring to the table. But the the good part of Tobias that we saw this spring that people talk about that we're at practice, we've got to see that a lot in the fall. If Tobias can take the breakout and build on it heading into the fall, he completely changes the, the dynamic of the offense, right? I mean, completely changes the dynamic of the offense. So I think he's an, a very important one. And then another one that I have, well, let me finish with Tobias a little bit and why it's important. 
I don't think Tobias has to be their leading receiver from a catch standpoint. In fact, I could see a scenario where Jaden Thomas is the team's leading receiver from a catch standpoint. But if Tobias leads this team in receiving yards, and you could make the same case for Deion Colsey, but if Tobias could do that from a yard standpoint, I think that completely changes how you defend Notre Dame because he's the field receiver. Let me explain why. He's the field receiver. A lot of the production from the field receiver is going to be in two areas. Number one, in space. It's what you just mentioned, Ryan. A guy that can catch an in, an, an under route. A guy that can catch an over route. A guy that can catch a crosser. A guy that can take a hitch, make one guy miss, and then go because you're going to be in space. And the other one is the way that they use that position, He it's about – can he take the top off of a defense? Can he vertically stretch a defense? Now, we saw him do it against Stanford, but can he do it against the better teams in the schedule? Right. The, if, if he is able to do that, Ryan, and he's a you know 50 catch, 850, 900 yard guy, let's just say, and that, that'd be a heck of a sophomore season. If he is that, you have to defend Notre Dame completely differently, which makes it harder to then handle the tight ends and Jane Thomas in the slot. It makes it harder to roll coverage into the boundary to ha- you know to deal with Deion Colsey. And it definitely makes it harder to put enough numbers in the box to defend the run game. So I think Tobias Merriweather stepping up would have a huge impact on the Notre Dame offense if he can take her in the fall. Because we've seen before, we've seen spring breakouts not actually break out in the fall. And that's the premise of this. It's like, yeah, it's great that you broke out in the spring, but it didn't continue in the fall, so it doesn't matter. Because that's all that really matters. I think you could make a case for Deion Colsey. I think you could make a case for a lot of receivers. And I think the one you made about Chris Tyree is excellent. There's another one. And I saw somebody, I was hoping nobody would mention it, but we saw somebody in the chat mention it. The other one's Rocco Spindler. I wouldn't say that he had necessarily a true breakout per se. I heard some good things about how he finished the spring. And I thought he played pretty well in the blue gold game. I did. I don't know if you had a chance to go back and watch it, Ryan, after you got home. But I, I, I was impressed with what I saw from Rocco. I, I really was. If he can take that ju- that third-year jump in the fall and build on what he did this spring, it completely changes the complexity of the interior. Because I could see a scenario where either, A, he beats somebody out, perhaps like a Andrew Christophic, who he's behind right now, or he's so good that you can now use him like as a third guard as part of rotation, which will help keep Christophic and Billy Shrouth more fresh as the season wears on but either way you're talking about a 325 pound kid that can move people if all of a sudden the right side of your offensive line is in a situation where Blake Fisher is your lighter of the two blockers (laughs) or you you know what I mean like let's be real Ryan if Blake's going to add weight on but it's probably getting back up to like 315 318 at the most 320 he's not going to get back up to 325 330 if Blake Fisher's your lighter player on the right side you're moving people this year amen and so i think billy uh rocco spindler if if he can carry this into the fall ryan rocco spindler could have a big impact on his football team when you talk about the ability to just go out there and and run on people and we know you know we're going to do it we know we're going to do it and there's not a dang thing you can do about it i'd love to see that it seemed like kind of midway through spring that the guys that we're talking about most as the potential starters are the guys that you had kind of penciled in before the spring is basically as the favorites, right? It's Billy Shrouth and it's Andrew Christophic. And we, we've talked so much about how competition breeds excellence, right? How competition matters so much. And we are also going to look at like Andrew Christophic is a fifth year player, right? And he has a good floor to him. You're like that, that kid when he was pressing the duty in 2021, played good football, right? Like he, he played good football when you needed him most. But is there another guard on the roster that maybe gives you more of an upside, more dynamic ability, more ability to really push the envelope as a run team? And could that be a guy like a Rocco Spindler, right? Like, could it be? It, it's possible that it could be. But again, in order to get to that point, Rocco was in a position where he was, there wasn't a ton of optimism about him coming into the spring because we know that there were obviously some concerns over the foot quickness and his development and all that great stuff. But coming out of the spring, you feel a lot better that you may have options inside a guard. Like it might not just be two guys that are penciled in because yes, they're good, but also they were the, 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 
like there was nobody else that could challenge them. Rocco stepped up to the plate this spring. And by the at end the of the end, spring, yeah. he said, you know, I'm going to be in this conversation at least. Like I'm not going down swinging. Like I'm going to, well, I'm going to go down swinging if nothing else. So I think it's great. I think it's getting him to take the next step. You also get Charles Jagasaw to come this summer as well for a more competition. Hopefully Ty Chan gets healthy and he's ready to go on full tilt. You need Hopefully competition Michael Carmody inside. can put some weight on and, and, and man. be healthy. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 So you, you get competition in there, man, and let the best two guards win or let a platoon happen. Like there's possibilities that could happen, but ultimately there's competition is never a bad thing. And I think that it could really help inside because you know that the tackles are going to be very good. You think that the center is also going to be very good, obviously, of the season that he just had, at the end of the season, I should say. The guards are the question mark right now, but I think that there's a lot of talent in that room, and Rocco is a part of that conversation. Defensively, Ryan, let's talk about some potential breakouts. I think the first one is obvious, Jason Onye. I mean, Jason Onye breaking out in the middle. I I, I put that. I sent a picture. To, I was talking to Sean Davis the other day, and we were just talking about Jason Onye, and I sent him a picture my wife took of him during the game and you're just like that's those guards don't aren't supposed to look like that i mean he's just he's got a six pack he's muscular i brought a sh- in in but the thing is he, it doesn't he doesn't just look the part right i've seen guys that look like that that can't play football at all can't I mean, move at and, all yeah. <laughs> yeah and and what jason showed this year is that he's the light has gone on a little bit for him on defensive line and this is why he had the grade that he had he had a three and a half star grade coming out of high school four and a half star upside because you always saw a guy that had the potential. It's just he hadn't played football for very long. And and he was one of those guys. I mean, his whole class really just had their careers absolutely wrecked by COVID, as their high school careers wrecked by COVID. And and you know, he's a guy that that you know, talking about 2019, he started to kind of show a little bit. He had 15 sacks, 76 tackles and 15 sacks. It just was one of those things where you didn't know if the light was ever gonna go on. And it started to this spring. And if it does go on, you're talking about Jason, you're talking about Riley Mills and Howard Cross as your starters. And if this version of Jason Onye carries into the fall with, with Gabriel Rubio working into the mix, now all of a sudden you're talking about, and, and you've got, you've still got guys like, like Aiden kind of Anna back there, who's gives you some beef. You're talking about Donovan Heinish, who had a really good spring. You know, Alexander, Alexander Ehrensberger played some inside. Tyson Ford, who had a really – he's another guy you could easily mention in this space as well. But Jason Onye having that breakout and carrying down the fall, all of a sudden I feel a lot better, a lot better about the interior of the Notre Dame defensive line if Jason Onye's breakout carries into the fall. A lot better. Yeah. And so I was I was going to go defensive line as well. I kind of wrestled between a couple guys. I, I wanted to go with Joshua Burnham because I think that you saw at the end of the spring, the lights start to come on, it seemed like, for him. But I feel like we've talked about him so much that, that <laughs> this offseason, right? So I could have used him. But I'm actually going to go with a guy that is also new to the program, Brian. We've seen him at times in the past, but not at a huge volume. Javante Jean-Baptiste is a guy that I am interested to see because you expected him to be a good football player when he got to Notre Dame, but by all indications of what you've seen and what others obviously have been reported, sounds like Javante had a really nice spring and showcase that he might be even better than what we originally thought Notre Dame was potentially getting out of the Ohio State transfer. And I really think that not only does it have a chance to make two positions better because you move Riley Mills inside, obviously from playing strong side end or field end or however you want to quantify it in this offense. But also I think Javante is a true edge compared to what Riley Mills was as kind of like that hybrid player where I think that Javante Jean Baptiste, if he is what he showed in this spring and is able to take that momentum into the off season, He's a guy that could become a little bit of a playmaker from the big end position, which is something that hasn't had enough of over the last couple of years. Like there's been good players at the big end. We talk about Myron Tango Vailoa Amosa. You talk about Riley Mills last year, good players at big end, but they didn't have a ton of backfield production from that big end position. And I think Javante Jean Baptiste could be a player that you look and say quietly has five or six sacks, 10 tackles mm-hmm. for loss, and has some proje- pro- production 
that you haven't had enough of from an impact perspective at the strong side end. So I was, I felt good about Javante transferring from Ohio State because I thought at least he would be a solid contributor. But after seeing and hearing what we saw of him from this spring, I think that my expectations have risen a little bit from the Ohio State transfer. Yeah. I wish we could have seen him in the last couple practices. I would feel a lot better about that if we could, to be honest with you. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of him. A couple other guys who had really good spring breakouts that I think are very important to success in the fall, and that is Jalen Sneed and Nolan Ziegler in different yep. areas. Nolan Ziegler is more of just a pure linebacker rotation guy that hopefully can push one of those, you know, I, the will. I mean, look, I'll just be honest. We were incredibly high on Maris Lufau last year, and I hope that that light goes on because he he has the ability. But I just I didn't see that anything this spring that would make me think the light has gone on. I don't know if you did in the blue gold game, but I just I didn't. If Nolan Ziegler can can push him, either one it pushes him out of the lineup, or two if if it's a true competition, and Maris still starts, it means Nolan's play pushed. Maris to be the player that we always hoped he could be and thought he could be right. Is that fair? Yeah. If it's a true competition. And I say that because if it's a true competition, the only way Maris starts is if Maris outplays Nolan, that's the only way he starts. And the only way Maris outplays Nolan is if he improves upon the things that hurt him last year. Yeah. Right. That's why true competitions are important. I don't see any scenario in which he beats out JD Bertrand this year. I just, I just don't. I think it's more of that will position. And, and then potentially, at the very least, he becomes like that swing Tavon Coney type guy. Remember, Tavon Coney in 2017 led the team in tackles and tackles for loss and didn't start but for a couple games that year because he was the backup to Niles and then the backup of Will. I'm not saying Nolan's going to lead the team in tackles. I'm just saying the swing role is the important part of what I'm talking about here. Get a ton of snaps. And then the other one's Jalen Sneed. Yep. Now, we didn't get a chance to see a ton of Jalen in the spring game doing what we were told behind the scenes was what he was doing so impactfully during spring practice, which was getting after the quarterback in the nickel packages. And so him doing that combined with adding a big jump in speed, just explosiveness and speed, him and Nolan, if they're playing a linebacker this year in any kind of rotation role, gives you a in and we're people that don't buy into the whole oh they're slow at linebacker jack kaiser's not slow jd bertrand's not slow maris lufau's not slow the first two guys are short and they're not real long but they're not slow right those two kids are still a lot faster i mean that's just yep. the reality of it so those guys continue their breakout in the spring guarantees that if there's a true competition the starters are going to be much better than they were a year ago because it's either going to be them or the starters that will start are going to be getting a lot more playing time. Or, me, excuse me, will improve, which will then allow them to, to justify their playing time. And so that's why it's important for those two guys to really break out and continue what they did in the spring and then build on it in the fall. Because that's what this is all about, right? Like you laid a foundation in the spring and you broke out. Now build on that and carry that into the fall. Don't, re re sure. don't regress. Don't take a step back. Build on it. I think that's a very important part of this. Well, so and – and linebacker, linebacker wasn't very good last season, right? Like there were good moments in each spot, but it just wasn't a consistent unit last year from Mike, Will, and Rover. Like there were up and down moments for each of those positions. So if you're Notre Dame, I mean, you also need linebacker position to get better. And in order for it to get better, you need a couple of those younger guys to really step up and push. Because to your point, Brian, maybe – you know, JD played pretty good football, but like he could take a step forward, right? Maris Loyfal can cer certainly take a step forward. Jack Kaiser can get better. Is if they are at least pushed to be the best version of themselves, then you have to give a big assist to guys like Nolan, to guys like Jalen Steed, because they challenge them to be the best version of themselves, or they take over a bigger role and they showcase the abilities that they have. Either way, linebacker is a position that flat out needs to get better than last season. And they have to be a part of the recipe for that. I didn't bring up Xavier Watts, Ryan, because I kind of feel like I kind of look at Xavier Watts like I look at Jaden Thomas. We didn't talk about Jaden Thomas much this spring. Goes out, no. plays great in the spring game, played good at all. I mean, he actually didn't play much of the spring practice we're at because they were pushing younger players. It's just one of those deals where it's like, yeah, but I kind of already just assume he's going to be pretty good, right? I mean, that may not be fair, but that's just kind of where I'm at. And Xavier Watts is the same way. We didn't see Xavier Watts break out this spring. Do you know why? For me, it's two areas. Number one, I think he already kind of broke out. 
I thought he was their best safety the last three games of the year last year. Number two, the offense literally spent the entire spring avoiding him. So I didn't see him do anything this spring because they just, they avoided him, right? And so to me, that's why Xavier Watts isn't in this conversation. Now, he needs to carry that over, right? Yes. But this is a different conversation. This is some, we kind of went in the spring expecting Xavier to be that dude. So I don't count that as a breakout. We expect him to be that dude, not just because of his talent, because he already showed it at the end of the year. He can be a difference maker. I mean, we saw him in three games make more disruptive plays, tackles for loss, sacks, breakups, you know, throwing off, uh, you know, adjustments from receivers than we saw from the safety position the entire year, in my opinion. When you look at the impact he made on the ball, is that is that an outrageous statement to make, Ryan? You, you talk about he had a tackle for loss on a sack against U.S. I mean, against uh, Boston College. He went out against uh, USC and had several breakups in that game. He had a, a huge breakup against South Carolina that forced him. I mean, ended up scoring on the next play on a fake, but it forced him into that situation. So I kind of view him as a breakout already. Uh, we didn't see Ramon break out. None of the corners had true breakouts with one exception. I thought Jaden Mickey is a guy that had a very good spring. And if Jaden can carry game. that, yes. If that if he can carry that into the season, now all of a sudden you're in a situation where Notre Dame has a legitimate corner rotation where they can give Cam Hart and Benjamin Morrison legit reps off in the non-big games. Meaning that you're not, I'm not taking Benjamin Morrison off the field against Ohio State. I'm not. But if I can take him off the field every third series against Navy, Tennessee State, Central Michigan, Duke, NC State, you know, those are those are important games. But I'm talking about like the teams that are when I and I, when I say big game, I'm not talking about the best teams. I'm talking about the teams that are just loaded at that position that you just can't afford to take him off the field. Right. Right. And so that's why I, I were like, I don't even count Clemson because you could afford to take him off the field for a series if you have a good player because I'm Clemson's receiving core doesn't scare me right now. USC's does. Ohio State's definitely does. And I can't afford to take him off the field because if they look at that and say, okay, I got Marvin Harrison against my their number three cornerback, they're going to do exactly what they did in the game last year when Tariq Bracey got hurt. Hey, their nickel, who's been killing us all game, just went off the field. They just brought in a true freshman. Guess where we're going on this next play, right? Yeah. So that's where I'm coming from. Jaden's Mickey's another one that if he can build on what he did this spring, the corner back depth chart becomes even stronger than it already was. Yep. Chance Tucker needs to I don't I don't think Chance had a breakout. I think Chance started to show some of that promise. Now he's got a breakout in the fall. But I thought yep. Jaden had a bit of a breakout and he took advantage, Ryan. This is what I think you talked about before the spring. He's got to take advantage of Cam Hart not practicing and not being in those team periods. And I thought he did. I, yep. I really do. I thought he did. I thought him and uh, Christian Gray before he had to get the scope, I thought they both played really good football. So, I mean, to your point, Brian, you know who Benjamin Morrison is now. You know who Cam Hart is. And I, I would still contend that Cam Hart, despite being a fifth-year player now, still has some upside that he can tap into, man. Like, I still don't think Cam Hart's the best version of himself. I don't. But the general fact is, is that you know who those two football players are. You don't really know who Christian Gray is yet. You don't really know who Jaden Mickey is yet. But if you are able to get contributions out of those two, then that makes your secondary just so much more flexible at times too, man. Like maybe in, instead of, you know, playing a true nickel in certain situations, maybe you say like those, that other, one of those other corners is too good not to be on the field. So like maybe even throw them out and you give them three cornerback looks at times. So that makes you so much more valuable because we are in a game today where, when you play against USC, to your point, right, they're going to have three to four wide receivers on the field most of the time. Like, that's just going to be the, the situation you're in. So there might be times where you have to say, hey, we might have to get a true corner on the field compared to a rover, even a nickel at times. Like, there might be that situation. And I think that that flexibility could be something that Jaden Mickey brings. I think it could be something that Christian Gray brings. And hopefully Chance Tucker could bring. But if we're talking about guys that I would quantify as breakouts, to your point, Jade Mickey would be in that conversation. And despite Christian Gray missing the last few practices, obviously, I think he fits in that conversation as well because Christian Gray was having a really strong spring before yeah. he was hurt, unfortunately. So it's one of those corners, man. I think that both of them have a chance to play. And if they do, and they're good players, and they're really good contributors, then Notre Dame's cornerback room just went from 
arguably one of the best duos in college football to arguably one of the best cornerback rooms in college football very quickly.